Good morning, everybody, and thank you for inviting me to come speak today. One of the interesting things about the human experience is that even though we all walk upright and we sleep lying down, we actually see the world in a different way. And what I mean by that is that as we were coming here today and walking through the streets of Dumbo, as an example, if somebody was an architect, they may have been walking around and looking at Dumbo from an architectural standpoint and noticing all of the different buildings. If somebody was a history professor, they would have come here and been thinking about the history of Dumbo and how much it's changed. If somebody was in retail, they'd be walking around and looking at the new retail stores and thinking about what other retail stores could be put in place. And that's one of the things that makes the human experience interesting and also beautiful because it creates a lot of variety and a lot of difference and a lot of different perspectives uh, on the world. But when it comes to social movements and social progress, it's important that for a moment in time we get everybody to see things in the same way as either wrong or right, there's a problem, there's a solution. And so my challenge here today in the short amount of time that we have together is to get you to view waste in the same way. So today, most people view waste as something you discard, you just throw it away and then you stop thinking about it. And in the short time that we have together today, I hope that you walk out of here thinking about waste and the things that you throw away and discard, not as something that has no value and you throw away and never think about it again. I want you to think of it as a valuable, as a very valuable resource. Okay? So that's going to be the focus of our conversation today. Uh, anybody have a, uh, want to guess why that number is up there? Oh. Why that number is up there? Help solve a $300 million problem? Do you know what $300 million problem is? Go ahead. Exactly. So most New Yorkers uh, put their garbage out on the curb and then they don't think anything of it. Uh, but in fact, our tax dollars go to shipping, uh, barging, and trucking our waste to faraway exports, faraway landfills, and we spend about $300 million a year uh, to do that. Anybody want to take a guess at what that map represents? Anybody? Go ahead. Exactly. So this map shows you where municipal solid waste is trucked around the United States to find landfill space. Now, you don't need to know much about the waste industry or the recycling industry or logistics to know that what's going on here is not good. Uh, I actually uh, use this as a map to found my uh, first company, Recycle Bank, and I showed this map to my 90-year-old grandmother in South Philadelphia. And she said, I, I don't know what that is, but whatever it is, someone needs to clean that up. <laughs> okay. And as a business person, you can see that there's a major problem here. People are driving all over the place to try and find landfill space. So that garbage that you put out on the curb every night in those black bags, it doesn't miraculously disappear. Your tax dollars are used to ship it, to truck it, to barge it all over the United States, hoping to find landfill space. It could actually be sold locally and made into new products. Uh, you can see down there the Virgin Islands. If uh, any of you ever go to the Caribbean and wonder why it's so pristine, one of the reasons is, is they actually ship their garbage up to, uh, up to the mainland here in North America. Uh, anybody here from either Toronto or Michigan? Okay, where are you from? Toronto. And where are you from? Toronto. Okay, anybody here from Michigan? Okay, it's good that you guys are sitting on the opposite side of the room because Toronto ships its garbage to a landfill in uh, Michigan, okay? Uh, so you can see how inefficient the system is. So one solution might be to just build more landfills, right? Let's just build more landfills and we have more space to put stuff in and we fix the supply and demand equation. Well, that's not gonna happen because landfills in the United States and landfill space in the United States is decreasing and it's gonna continue to decrease because nobody wants to have a landfill built near where they live. Everybody wants to buy products 
and have things, but nobody wants to take responsibility for having a dump near where they live to put the stuff in. So landfill space is decreasing. So there's a major cost to not recycling. Put it out as garbage, someone needs to pay to ship it, barge it, truck it to a faraway landfill. There's another opportunity, which is not only can you save money by not sending it to landfill, you can actually sell it. This is the amount of money that's lost every year from the commodities that we put into landfill. It's $11 billion a year of material that could be sold, that we just pay to stick in a landfill. 30 years from now, after hopefully this problem has been completely fixed and uh, we've been living uh, in a manner in which waste is viewed as a resource for a number of years, people will look back at the way we've lived for the last 50 years and how we've handled waste and they'll shake their head and say, what were those people thinking? They were paying to ship something to a far off state where they then paid to put it in a landfill when they could have actually sold it to somebody locally who would then turn it into a product and sell it. And they'll shake their head and wonder, what were we thinking about? Okay, so you can see the opportunity there. So that's the problem that we're going to deal with today. And hopefully by the time we get done, you're going to look at waste as a resource. Now, the opportunity for a lot of people in the room is you're designers, uh, you're artistic, you're creative. This is a Creative Mornings event. And you have an important part to play in the solution. Because at the heart of the problem is that a lot of packaging and products are designed and manufactured in a way that makes it very difficult for them to be recycled. And so my other challenge today is for you to also walk out of here and think about how you can use your creative skills to help redesign products and packaging to make sure that they're more recyclable. And if you're not a designer, you also have an opportunity here which is when you walk out of here, next time you go to buy something, think about what it's made from and how it's packaged and make sure that you're gonna be able to recycle it. Because if you can't, you're gonna end up paying more than you think you're paying for that product. You're gonna end up paying for it to be disposed of in a landfill. It's a hidden cost and it's in the hundreds of millions of dollars. This is what our waste stream looks like in New York City. About 35% of our waste stream is metal, glass, plastic, paper. 35% of our waste stream is organic material. And that's something I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about uh, today along with product design. And when I say organic material, I mean all of our food waste, our soiled paper, our leaf and yard waste. Now, today we do a decent job of recycling our metal, glass, plastic, and paper in New York City. We recycle about 50% of all of the material that's out there. It's not good. It's not bad. We're implementing some programs to make it much better. But 100% of our organic waste, the entire 35%, we send to landfill. And when you have organic waste sitting in landfill, it decomposes and emits methane, which is a harmful greenhouse gas. The opportunity is you could process that organic waste locally in New York City or the greater New York City metro area and turn it into compost, which is a product that you could sell. You could actually even turn it into renewable energy. And so in a couple of weeks in New York City, we're going to be starting a project where we're going to be converting some of our organic waste that we used to truck to faraway landfills. And we're going to be using a technology to convert it into natural gas that will be used right here as renewable energy. Another 10% of our waste stream are textiles, so our clothes, and electronic waste. And we'll talk about a little bit what we're doing in that area. And then the other 20% is other. And anytime you're talking about waste and you see the word other without any more of a description, <laughs> take it from somebody who's in the waste industry, be afraid. Okay? <laughs> be very, very afraid. And I will talk to you about what we're doing to take care of the other. And that's a lot of where the product design comes to. Okay. This is what recycling and waste diversion currently looks like in New York City. About 85% of our waste stream we sent to landfill. And you can see from the earlier slide, there's no reason to do that because most of what we have in New York City is actually recyclable. But today we send about 85% of our waste stream to landfill. We spend about $300 million a year doing that. We capture about 39% of our paper. So about 60% of all the paper 
we still send to landfill. We capture about 49% of all the metal, glass, and plastic out there. So we still send about 50% of all the metal, glass, and plastic to landfill. Now organic waste, zero. We're really not capturing much of it at all. We have a couple of programs around the city. Uh, we're starting to make a dent, uh, but it's statistically still at zero. Uh, by next year, it'll be much higher because of some of the programs we're launching. The mayor would like to double New York City's recycling rate by 2017. And what that would look like if we were able to accomplish it is that 70% of our waste stream would then be going to landfill. Still too much, but a major improvement. About 50% of all the paper would be captured, about 73% of all the metal, glass, and plastic, and 17% of all the organics. Still much, much more to do, but that's the next goal that we want to get to. Now, let me talk about paper for a second because it'll be a good way to sort of tie a bow on the economics of what we've been talking about so far. So we know that if you throw paper into the garbage, we're going to have to pay to ship it to a landfill. Well, there's another problem with doing that, which is we actually get paid for our paper in New York City. So we send right now about 400,000 tons of paper to landfill every year. We spend about $40 million a year shipping paper out of landfill. There's a company in New York City called Pratt that pays us a floor of $10 a ton for our paper. So that $300 million that I showed you, there's a lot of complex projects that need to be put together to eliminate all $300 million. But there's also a lot of low-hanging fruit that we can attack today to really decrease that number significantly. And one example is make sure that all the paper in New York City is recycled. You would take a $50 million chunk out of that $300 million if everybody just made sure that they recycled their paper. And so the next time you see someone in your building or on your street throwing paper in the garbage, stop them and tell them that you don't care if they're Republican, you don't care if they're Democrat, you don't care if they think that Al Gore is a saint or Al Gore should be locked up, you don't care if they're conservative or, or liberal, you care about the fact that they're costing you money, right? Their action of taking that paper and putting it in the garbage means that you need to participate in paying and sending that to landfill and are not having your city generate revenue for that. It's really that simple and clear. To show you the material that's still left in uh, our waste stream that's going to landfill, you can see how much uh, organic waste we still have in our landfill, in, in our landfill stream. It's about 1.2 million tons of waste a year. We spend about hundred million dollars a year exporting organic material to landfill. Okay, hundred million dollars a year. And as I mentioned, very soon we're going to start converting some of that into renewable energy. We send about 400,000 tons of paper, about 200,000 tons of metal, glass, and plastic, and about 100,000 tons of textiles to landfill every year. There's a lot we can still do. Just to walk through the economics of what things look like in New York City, every ton we send to landfill costs us about $86. Paper costs us nothing to process. We get paid a floor of $10. Metal, glass, and plastic, we pay something to get it uh, processed, but it's a lot less than taking it to landfill. Uh, organics, processing it significantly less than taking it to landfill, and there's the opportunity to generate compost and renewable energy. So we've been talking a little bit about organic waste. So what are we doing in New York City to tackle this organic waste problem? It's huge. It's over a million tons. So in September, we started a program in New York City public schools. We started with schools in Manhattan and Brooklyn. We're about to expand to schools in Staten Island, and we'll be going citywide come September where all of the students in the cafeteria and all the workers in the kitchen source separated their organic material. And this program has a lot of opportunity for us because there's a lot of food waste in those cafeterias and kitchens that we can divert, but it's also a great way to educate people. A lot of you in the room deal in social media and marketing and communications. You know how difficult it is to teach people things or to get them to change their behavior. Well, there's a million kids in New York City public schools, right? It's like a country unto itself. And then there's all of the teachers, and then there's all of the parents, and then there's all of the staff. And so we recognize that by launching our organics programs first in the schools, one is we could capture a lot of material, but then as we deployed additional organics programs around the city, we would have had this whole cadre of students that had already been 
doing this at home and could educate their parents and practice it at home. So we launched this program in September. And again, remember our, our diversion percentage in New York City is currently 15%. Uh, Department of Education has about the same diversion percentage, so still sending 85% of their waste to landfill. After only three months, we were able to increase the diversion percentage by over 100%. Uh, percent. We took the schools in Manhattan to over 34% and the schools in Brooklyn to uh, over 38%. So you can see that very quickly uh, we can dramatically increase that number by applying the right programs. This is some of the different organics programs that we're launching around New York City to tackle those million tons that are currently going to landfill. Uh, how many people here participate in the green market program where you can go to the green markets and drop off your organic waste? Okay, so I see a, a few hands. So just so everybody knows, if you live near a green market, uh, if you store your organic waste during the week, you can take it to the green markets and there's containers there where you can drop off your organic uh, Waste. So that's a program that's been going on for the last year. We've collected over a million pounds of organics. Uh, then there's our school waste uh, program that got launched. Um, we started collecting uh, from agencies. So Homeless Services in Brooklyn uh, has started to source separate their organics and we're collecting it. Now, what's interesting about doing organics programs in cities is that it provides additional opportunities besides just saving money from landfill diversion and creating renewable energy and compost. In a place like New York City that some people, some people think has a rat problem. I, I don't want to <laughs> get in a debate as to whether or not there's rats in New York City or not. Let's just assume for the purpose of this conversation there's rats in New York, in New York City. Right? The reason that we have rats is we take our food waste along with the rest of our restaurants, we put it in a black bag and we pile it on our street corners. It's like a buffet for, <laughs> for rats. There's probably rats from other cities who when they hear about how we do things in New York City uh, migrate, migrate here. And so what Homeless Services recognized is that uh, if they could take all of their food waste and instead put it in one of our special organic containers, which is a big container that's sealed, has a lid with a lock and wheels on it, that it would eliminate the rat problem in their facilities. And a lot of uh, their neighbors complain that you know, there's a homeless service facility here, there's all these people coming in, they're eating, there's food waste on the curb, it's causing rats on and so forth. They just eliminated a major problem that they have. So we're really glad to have homeless services participating in Brooklyn. And then uh, a project that's now uh, getting launched this spring is focused on the mother load of organics, which is the organic material in all of our homes. And so uh, two weeks ago, we launched our first high-rise organics program. The Helena, which is a high-rise building on 57th Street, is the first building in Manhattan to do high-rise organics collection. Uh, on every floor in the recycling room, there's now an organics container where residents can put their uh, organic material. And we at Department of Sanitation come by uh, every day and collect that organic material. And then in a couple of weeks, we're going to start our first curbside organic collection program which is uh, single family homes in New York City will start getting special organics containers and they'll be able to put all of their food waste in those containers and we will come by on your recycling day and collect your organic waste. So that program is gonna start in single family homes in select areas in May. Uh, a lot of people don't think of New York City and single family homes as synonymous. People think of certain parts of Brooklyn and Manhattan as New York City. But when you look at Staten Island and parts of Brooklyn and parts of Queens and parts of the Bronx, there's actually a lot of single family homes. So this gives you an idea of some of the programs that we're launching to tackle organic waste. Okay. So I'm going to show you something I call the managed resource loop, which is how I view uh, programs that focus on waste diversion for uh, cities. You can see just through the conversation so far, there's a complexity in putting programs together because you're not dealing with one type of commodity. You're dealing with paper, metal, glass, plastic, textiles, electronic waste, food waste, as well as some other things. So there's a certain complexity in putting these programs together. Additionally, you're not dealing with one type of housing stock. You're dealing with high-rise, multifamily, schools, agencies, single-family homes. There's a lot of complexity of putting these programs together. So this is a model I've developed for cities to have a holistic view in terms of how to solve their issues. So the first part of it is for you guys, right? Who are product designers in the room, is product design. 
A lot of people think about waste and recycling programs and think about the right kind of trucks and the right kind of facilities and the right kind of messaging. That's the wrong place to start. The right place to start is around product design and making sure that all of the products and packaging that come into our system can be recycled and that there's a market for it. And that's a growing movement and there's actually going to be a meeting uh, coming up in New York at the end of April where some of the largest retailers, some of the largest CPG companies, some of the largest design firms are all coming together with some of the largest recycling companies and talking about what are people using that is not recyclable, how can we change some of our products and uh, packages. So if you're a product designer, there's a lot of opportunity for you and there's a lot of need. Next is extended producer responsibility. And the first thing that we want people to do is to redesign their packaging and products to make sure that they're recyclable. But if for some reason they're not interested in doing that, uh, they need to understand that government has a role to play, which is to ensure that taxpayers are not responsible for picking up the cost of disposing of their products or packaging. And that's called extended producer responsibility. And in that case, uh, government either looks to ban or to tax uh, that type of material or packaging or product uh, to make sure that taxpayers are not responsible for that. And we'll touch on an example of uh, one piece of extended producer responsibility we're trying to pass in New York City uh, in a little bit. Uh, next is infrastructure and technology. Uh, you can design all this material properly uh, and you can get it recycled, but you need the facilities to actually recycle all this material. Remember, we're talking about millions and millions of tons of material. Uh, New York City is opening up one of the most advanced recycling facilities in the world in August in Brooklyn. Uh, we have a, an advanced paper recycling facility out in Staten Island, but these facilities cost 10, 20, sometimes over 50 million dollars. The one in Brooklyn is over a hundred million dollars worth of investment to build. So it's not as easy as just saying, hey, let's make sure we have recycling infrastructure. It requires a lot of capital. In order for people to invest that capital, they need to be sure that they're going to be getting the material and the right material. And towards the end of the presentation, I'll talk to you a little bit more about how we can put models together and make sure that investment is there. Next is communications, and that very relevant to a lot of the people in the room that deal with social media and communications. You have to make sure people understand why it's important to do something. So if I walk up to most people in New York City and say, hey, I really need you to recycle, they'll generally respond with some type of, yeah, I know it's good for the environment, but you know, it's not convenient, it's hard. I need them to understand that, yes, it is good for the environment, but it's also good for their pocketbooks. And that's what motivates a lot of behavior is it's good for your pocketbook. And it's important for New Yorkers to understand that. The other thing that's important for New Yorkers to understand is what things are oftentimes made of because it would actually help them change their behavior. So what's pl what, what are plastic water bottles made from? Who knows what's, pl what's plastic made from? Oil. Oil, exactly. So most New Yorkers, most people around the United States, they don't know that plastic is made from petroleum. When you throw a water bottle in the garbage, you are literally throwing oil in the garbage. Thinking about that makes you look at throwing water bottles in the garbage differently. So communications is really important. Incentives. We'll talk about a little bit incentives later on, but uh, we all do things based on different motivations and self-interest and the interest of our community. It's important that the right incentives are in place. And then there's collection. You have to make sure that uh, the city is prepared and committed to collection. So we'll touch on a couple different parts of this model and I'll give you a couple of different examples. Let's start off with product design. I'm going to show you some bad examples of product design. Okay? What is going on here? Right? What, what, what's the actual product here? Right? The actual product is just this little thing right here. But you have plastic around that, then you have cardboard, then you have plastic around that, then you have some more plastic around that, and then it's in a cardboard box. Right? There's just a tremendous amount of unnecessary packaging. And it's actually bad for the company's bottom line. They could get rid of a lot of this packaging. This plastic wrapper, we cannot recycle. It breaks the machinery and there's no market for it. Okay? So just terrible, terrible design. This is also terrible design. Um, this is foam. Okay? Uh, we cannot recycle foam. All right? Another example of poor design. This plastic wrapper, we cannot recycled plastic film. Another example of uh, bad design. Uh, up there you have fruit in a little plastic cup. Not a good use of resources. Okay. This is another example of poor design. You've got a box 
which has a plastic holder, which has a plastic wrapper, which has individual candies that each have a plastic wrapper that then have a cardboard covering that then have another plastic wrapper until you get to the actual product. Um, this company is spending a lot of money on packaging that they don't need and then putting packaging into our system that we can't recycle. And I can give you countless examples of poor design and the opportunity with good design is that it can actually save companies a lot of money. A great example of a company in the retail space that has saved a lot of money and increased its margins through design is when you go to Patagonia, there's no plastic wrapping, there's no packaging to their clothes. They decided, actually for environmental reasons, because it's the ethos of their company, that they were going to get rid of all packaging. You buy something at Patagonia, you might get a small uh, paper uh, thing to tie up the shirt with, but that's about it. So they got rid of all their packaging, and packaging is expensive. You have to buy the material, you have to pay people or buy machinery to actually do the packaging. Then that packaging increases the volume of the product, so it takes up space in the truck, Okay, so it decreases the amount of things that you can ship, and then it takes space on your shelf, so it decreases the amount of stuff you can put on your shelf. Patagonia got rid of all of that. All of that cost they got rid of, and guess what? They did not decrease their prices. Okay, so through design, they're actually able to increase their margins. Another example of poor design, uh, this plastic film wrapping on these magazines, we can't recycle it. Okay, we can't recycle it. All of these examples that I'm giving you of companies using materials and design, that is not recyclable. Uh, you can look at it as poor design and unfortunate. I also want you to look at it as, guess who's paying for that? Not the company, you are as taxpayers. Okay? Um, another example of uh, bad design that I will, <laughs> that, uh, that I'll show you a, a great solution uh, to. So this is um, the way laundry detergent has been done for a long time. It's uh, jugs made mostly of water. You think you're buying detergent. It's a lot of water in there. It's this huge jug that you know you gotta you gotta carry, uh, and it's and it's messy, right? So there's a company called Method. How many people here use Method cleaning products? Okay. So Method is mostly known because they created non-toxic uh, cleaning products. It's kind of an oxymoron that we used to buy cleaning products that had toxic chemicals in them. You would clean your floor, but you didn't want your baby. Uh, rolling around on the floor because of the chemicals that you just used to clean the floor. Um, so Method is mostly known for creating a uh, toxic free cleaning product, but something that they also should be recognized for is that they redesign the way packaging is done in an entire industry. And so uh, I wanted to show you some bad examples of packaging, but I want to also show you some great examples of design and packaging. So this is what used to happen is, you know, you'd get your big jug filled mostly of water, you'd unscrew that cap, you'd put the cap on uh, top of the washing machine, you'd pour the stuff in, it would overflow, it'd get messy, it's a lot of waste, right? It's, it's disgusting, you know, so. <laughs> uh, yeah. um, and so Method came up with a way to concentrate, concentrate the detergent, thereby needing less packaging. They also came up with another really cool invention, which is a squirt top. Right? So now you're not unscrewing, you've got two pieces, you've got different types of plastics that you're using, maybe one thing gets recycled, one thing doesn't, it's all one piece, it's convenient, you're not wasting the material, and it's concentrated into a smaller piece of packaging. Okay? Now, one of the interesting things about packaging and design is that you know, there's a lot of companies out there, but what's happened in the last 10, 20 years, they've been consolidated into about 10 companies. And so, in terms of the vast majority of things that we buy, there's 10 companies out there that own those brands. And so, we have an opportunity to sit down with not hundreds of companies to solve this, but really a handful of companies and get everybody on the same page in terms of good product design. Okay? Next is I want to talk, touch about extended producer responsibility. So, hopefully, we can look at every piece of product and every piece of packaging in our waste stream and figure out ways to redesign it to reduce the amount of packaging and then make sure that all of the packaging is recyclable. But sometimes there's companies and industries that want to maintain certain types of packaging uh, in the market and unfortunately that's problematic for uh, the environment because it's not good for the environment and it's problematic for cities because there's no market for it. A good example of that is foam. Okay? Uh, the coffee cups, the food containers, the peanuts that we have in our system, not only do we not have a market for them, uh, it's highly toxic to the environment and it actually breaks our 
uh, recycling machinery. So I don't know if uh, any of you have heard about this in the paper yet or people talking about it, but uh, we've proposed a ban on foam products in New York City. All right? So, thank you. Uh, so this is, this is a really important first step for us in New York City, as well as across the country, uh, to make industries and companies understand that if they're selling a product or packaging, that's great. That's spurring economic drive in our economy. But they need to make sure that that product and package can be recycled. And if they can't do that, we're going to take whatever action is necessary to make sure that they assume that cost or that they uh, can't sell it. So we've gotten great response from the public regarding this. We've also got a great response from a number of companies who have said, hey, we've been trying to sell alternative packaging in the New York City market that is either compostable or recyclable. This is great. It's going to create jobs for us. It's going to allow us to grow. So putting all of these solutions in place requires a team effort. It requires people to design packaging better. It requires people to invest in uh, the right type of technology. But it also requires citizens to be involved. And that means buying the right things, but it also means interacting with your city council members and your elected officials. So if you think that this is something that's good for your community, this is something that's coming up for a vote over the summer in city council, let your city council members know. But this is a great example of extended producer responsibility. We've looked at our entire waste stream in New York City. We've categorized it down to the most infinitesimal piece of uh, waste and anything that got into that other category, uh, we usually had our hazmat you know, uniforms on when we were going through that stuff. Um, and we're looking at ways to either make sure that that is eliminated from the waste stream through product design. If we can't do it that way, we're looking to eliminate it through extended producer responsibility. All right, so next is infrastructure and technology, communications. I'll talk to you a little bit about incentives and something that I was involved in in terms of uh, how to create incentives and motivate. So a company that I founded was a CEO of from 2004 to 2010 is a company called Recycle Bank. And what I was looking to do was change people's behavior. I found that when I would go and talk to a lot of people about changing the way they behaved in regards to the environment, the response I would oftentimes get is, yeah, I know it's the right thing to do, but doing stuff for the environment is expensive and the economy's not good and I don't have money and da 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 And I kept thinking to myself, I need to find a way to make sure that people view environmental decisions as smart economic decisions. So I co-founded a company around a company called Recycle Bank, still in operation uh, today, where we signed long-term contracts with cities. Um, every home got one of our recycling containers. There's a chip embedded in that container. There's a technology put on the recycling truck that picks up the container, reads the chip, identifies that your home recycled and how much you recycled, and provides you points, just like airline miles for the fact that you recycled and how much you recycled. You're getting recognized and rewarded for the fact that you've pulled that material out of the landfill. This is was our original website. And this was the original account statement that we provided people. We made your interaction with what you viewed as waste as an interaction with what we now wanted you to view as a resource. And we allowed you to personalize it. So you could put your picture on your account page could see your address. You could see each week that you recycled and how many points you earned. Go and use your points to shop at local and national businesses. And this was the results that we started to see very early on and we still see today, is that we could dramatically increase recycling rates by personalizing people's experience as well as giving them a financial reward for recycling. We were creating the first waste management utility. One of the problems in waste is that the price and the cost is not transparent. If I came over to your house and I left the lights on and I just left, you would say, God, that guy's a jerk. Like, comes into my house, leaves the lights on all over the place and just walks out. Like, I'm not inviting that person back over. Like, I'm not going to pay for that. Or if you had invited someone to stay over at your place and you came back and they had just left the water running, you'd be like, what's, what's this person doing? Like, I'm not going to took stuff out of my fridge, okay, but they left the water running, like that cost me money, right? Well, we don't price waste properly, and so when people come over to your house and just throw things in the garbage, you're like, well, I, don't, I, don't, you know, I guess they don't recycle. But you didn't view it as, whoa, 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 well, I, gotta, I gotta pay to get rid of that stuff, like my city could have sold that. And so what we were trying to do with Recycle Bank is create the first waste management utility to show you that there's value to what you have, rather than just throwing it out in the garbage, we want people to look at it and say, hey, wait a second, all these 
water bottles and all this paper that I have, there's value to that. I will change my behavior if my city shares in that value. Okay. Uh, so that's the incentives piece. Then there's uh, the collection portion, but it requires all of these pieces to make a program successful. So the solution to uh, waste management problems in cities is not simple. It requires a lot of pieces to come together. But if it can be accomplished, it will save cities a lot of money, but it also supports a lot of industries. The important thing about getting this accomplished in New York City is there's no other city that has a waste management system as complex as New York City. People oftentimes point to San Francisco as an example of uh, waste management being managed properly. And they do a phenomenal job, as does Portland and uh, Seattle. And there's a lot to learn from those cities. And San Francisco is an amazingly beautiful city and a great place to live and a great place to visit. But San Francisco has how many residents? Anybody know? One yeah, so it has, right, so it's closer to half a million. It has a little bit over half a million residents. Uh, anybody know how many people live in New York City? What's that? 8.3. So there's, a, there's about 8 million people that we know of. There's about 8 point million people that we know of that live in New York City, okay? How many people uh, come and visit New York City every year? What's that? 50 million visitors every year. So actually, uh, after this presentation, I'm running to Times Square because a lot of those people that come into the city visit Times Square and a lot of people go through there on their way to work. And one of the things we realized in New York City is that we needed to provide better infrastructure on the street for people to recycle. So uh, we're going to be launching a campaign of putting over 1,000 recycling containers on New York City street corners over the next year. <laughs> Thank you. And that, that starts today. We're in Times Square. Uh, there's going to be a launch of uh, putting a recycling container on every corner in Times Square, and it'll spread from uh, today. But you can, you can see how complex waste management solutions are, and New York City provides an additional complexity. We just have way more people, way more visitors, and the other thing we have is a much more complex built environment. We don't have just single-family homes like a Houston or a Phoenix. Um, we don't have uh, just a couple of high-rise buildings or multifamily buildings like some other cities have. We have every type of building you can imagine in New York City. And so it's very, very complex here to manage waste. And so the opportunity we have here is to solve our own problem, but to also be a model of urban environmental management when it comes to waste for any major city in the world. And so there's a lot of opportunity here to solve the problem. Okay, so what are we doing in New York City to apply this model? and solve this problem. How is this going to benefit you? So this is a look at the waste stream that I showed you before. Remember, 35% is organic, 35% is metal, glass, and plastic, 8% is textile, 2% is about e-waste, and then 20% is other. Right? So what are we doing? So let's start with what we have today for metal, glass, plastic, and paper. So as I mentioned, we're launching a major campaign where we're going to be putting over 1,000 recycling containers on New York City street corners. They're going to be newly designed containers. Uh, the ones that are going out in Times Square are actually a, a special type of container called a big belly container, which actually has solar compaction uh, to it. But most of the containers that we're going to be getting in New York City uh, look like the sleek gray ones you see down there. So uh, I'm a big believer in you have to make a product effective, but you have to, have to make it look beautiful. Uh, so we're going to try and make the design of our new containers look very sleek and unique on our street corners. Then uh, in a couple of weeks, we're going to be announcing that we're increasing the amount of plastics that we can take. So one of the things that's confusing today in our program is that we uh, tell people you can only pl recycle plastic ones and twos, and everyone's busy with all the different things they're doing. They have a piece of plastic, and they're like, oh, is it one, is it two? I don't know. It says four. I don't know. Like, maybe it's just like two things of two equal five. Like, I don't know what, I don't, you know, forget it. Like, I'm just throwing it in the garbage. Right? So, uh, coming in late April, you'll be able to recycle all rigid plastic. So forget the number one, forget the number two. If it's a rigid plastic, we're going to take it. And, and, that, and that goes to making the messaging easier, right? So basically the message is going to be if you can rip it, if you can tear it, we'll take it. We'll sell it. We'll sell it. We'll, we'll bring more revenue into the city. So if you can rip it, you can tear it, we'll take it. If it's metal, we'll take it. If it's plastic, we'll take it. If it's aluminum, we'll take it. If it's glass, we'll take it. Don't ask us any questions. Just give it to us. If it's paper, metal, glass, plastic, or aluminum, okay? So that's another program that's going to come that's going to make it a lot easier. 
A program that we launched is our refashion program. Textiles are a surprisingly large portion of our waste stream. It makes up about 8% of our waste stream. Um, and a lot of it has to do is just clothes, sheets, towels, weigh a lot. Uh, we launched this program called Refashion. If you live in a high-rise building, your super can request one of our refashion uh, containers and uh, we'll deliver it to the building. Uh, residents can put all of their textiles that they don't need anymore uh, into that container and when it's full, we come by free of charge, collect the textiles and make sure they're recycled. We're going to be launching the same program for electronic waste where come uh, September you'll be able to uh, order an electronic waste container for your building. Uh, you'll be able to put all of your electronic waste in that container when it's full, free of, servers, free of charge, we will come by and uh, collect it. Uh, in terms of that other portion, uh, that's where extended producer responsibility comes in. We're starting first with uh, foam, but we're looking at our entire waste stream and anything that's in there that's uh, not recyclable, does not have a market, we're looking at legislation to try and get it out of uh, the system. If for some reason any of you work for a company that manufactures uh, or designs uh, or sells something that you might think is not recyclable, does not have a market, go back today and have conversations internally. You have some time to, to make a change. And then on the organic side, as I mentioned, uh, we have our curbside organics program that's starting that we're very excited about. We've already launched our school and agency organics collection program. Uh, and then we're looking at different ways to process our organic. So we have some compost facilities in New York City, turns organic waste into a fertilizer. We have a program that's starting where we're going to be converting some of our organic waste into natural gas, turning it into renewable energy. We've been uh, pitched by one company that can convert our organic waste into fuel that our sanitation vehicles can run on. So we're looking at different ways to process our organic material. And then items impacting all categories. Uh, in about a month we're launching a major media and outreach campaign all over the city. Uh, we have some additional legislation uh, that's coming out to make it easier for uh, buildings to understand and operate uh, the way we want it to. And then, and then we constantly do waste studies. We're constantly looking at our waste stream to understand what's going on. So these are the things that uh, you're either getting uh, now that's been introduced in the past year or uh, you'll get during the course of the next year. Okay, uh, the thing I'm going to uh, conclude the presentation with is, now these are a lot of great ideas that uh, were thrown out here in terms of how to solve these problems, but at the end of the day, uh, a lot of these pro programs need to be financed. Now fortunately in New York City, uh, we have a mayor who a year ago recognized the importance of waste diversion and the need to dramatically increase recycling and uh, decided to invest in the solutions. And so fortunately in New York City, uh, we have a mayor that's very focused on sustainability and we have the investment to do all of these things. But that's not always the case in every city and every situation. And so uh, there's a lot of great ideas that um, were thrown out during the presentation and there's a lot of great ideas out there uh, in the industry and the community on different things that could be done, but they require investment. And so this is a model that I put together recently and we've started to work with uh, different retailers and CPG companies and people in the investment community and the uh, recycling space to come together to make sure that the capital is available to solve these problems. And I'll walk you through uh, how that would work so that if people have great ideas on how to solve this problem, they can see what's coming down the line. So you have all of these brands and uh, industries that need to see recycling increase. So for instance, Coca-Cola wants to see recycling increase for a couple of reasons. They want that plastic and they want that aluminum back on the market. Right? They have to go find virgin aluminum or get oil if people don't recycle their products. So they want to see recycling increase. They also want to see it increase because uh, state legislators have a tendency to pass legislation to tax them or to force them to uh, pay for recycling programs. Uh, you have the recycling and the waste management industry that wants to see recycling increase. So the concept is the brands and industry would make an investment in what's called the social impact fund. You would then have applications from municipalities or entrepreneurs who had ideas on how to divert waste from the landfill who would come to the social impact fund and say, hey, here's this idea. I know how to either redesign this package or I have this technology that can recycle things more efficiently or I have a way to incentivize people to recycle. Select programs receive funding so there would be an investment committee that would look at the different programs and say you know what I, I think this will work. 
and they have a partnership with the municipality, or a municipality has found an entrepreneur, a private company, and together we think that they can divert this amount of material from landfill, or increase the productivity by recycling by this amount. So select programs would receive funding, the programs would get launched, there would be measurement and reporting. We would look at the programs and study, are they being effective? Are they diverting waste? Are they recycling things more efficiently? Have they found a market? If you saw an increase in recycling, you would then have an increase in revenue and a savings in landfill costs. The munis and entrepreneurs would then either repay the loan or repay the investment. And you would have a virtuous cycle of investment going back into the system, supporting entrepreneurs and cities who need capital to solve this problem. You would also be creating a network of best practices. And then the brands and industries would also see a return on investment from investing in social progress and waste management. A lot of companies today spend a lot of money on corporate social responsibility. It's great that it's increasing. But if you ask a lot of companies, what's your return on investment? It's hard for them to measure. And it's important for these companies to start to see how their investments in social progress and social good and community programs actually have a positive impact on their bottom line. So this is just one model of how you can finance uh, solutions in the space. Uh, and that's the conclusion of my presentation. So. Thank you.